Yeah, when the play opens, uh, what two people have recently died? Well, it's within three months. Henry the Sixth and his son Edward. Uh, Richard suggests he will play the role of the vice or devil or villain. He marries Anne, and only Anne, one person, I don't remember who, put both Anne and Elizabeth, and I put which one? Am I supposed to, you know, flip a coin? Um, it's just Anne. He doesn't marry Elizabeth. Um, number five, ones I could think of off the top of my head, Hastings, Buckingham, Stanley, Brackenbury's not one of them. Brackenbury actually dies um, in the battle defending, fighting for Richard. Okay? He doesn't turn against Brackenbury. Um, number six, why does he say he's going to play the role of the vice, devil, or villain? You had to mention his physical deformity. It's, it's not just because he's a sociopath. It's possible that he is that. Um, it's because of his physical deformity that people run away from shy from him that he's going to, okay, so if they think I'm that, he's going to be what they think he is, okay? Um, number seven, we're going to talk about this because we're going to back up just briefly towards the end of Act 3, 3, scene 6 or 7. Does he act like he wants the crown? No. No. He appears to not want it and only grudgingly agrees to take it or accept it. Okay. He creates and spreads propaganda against the king. We're going to pick up with this at the very end of Act 3, scene 5. What does he say about the two little princes and their father, Edward IV, who dies in the course of the play. Illegitimate. That is, he not only implies the little princes are illegitimate, but even Edward was illegitimate. That is, Edward shouldn't have been king in the first place. Okay? Um, and Edward IV is the king who dies in the first three acts. And then lastly, <clears throat> what title does Richard receive? Lord Protector. You had to have both Lord and Protector. I mean, Lord, he's a sir, so he's automatically that. Uh, but you had to have the Protector part too. Okay. <coughs> so, like I said, I want to briefly go back to the end of Act 3, Scene 5. Uh, picking up with lines 73, 74. Richard's talking to Buckingham. And he tells him, go after the mayor. He's on his way to the guild hall. Go after the mayor. And at your meet's advantage of the time, that is, and wait for the appropriate moment. And when that appropriate moment presents itself, do what? Infer the bastardy of Edward's children. Tell them how Edward put to death a citizen only for saying he would make his son heir to the crown, meaning indeed his house, which by the sign thereof was termed so. Moreover, urge his hateful luxury and bestial appetite in change of lust, okay, which stretched under their servants, daughters, wives, etc., etc. That is, Edward slept with whatever moved. That's what he's saying to imply about Edward. Okay? Nay, you can even come this close to me. Okay, not my nephews, to me. Tell them when that my mother went with child or of that insatiate Edward, noble York, my princely father, Edward, his father's name was Edward, my princely father then had wars in France. So if his father was in wars in France when his mother became pregnant with his brother, hmm. and by true computation of the time found that the issue was not his begot, which well appeared in his lineaments, being nothing like the noble duke my father. What does that mean? Which being well appeared in his lineaments, being nothing like the noble duke my father. Yeah, Edward's a looker. Dad wasn't. Dad was ugly. Edward was handsome. Ugly father. 
Richards, I believe. Okay. Edward's obviously the uh, outlier here. He I mean, had to come from somebody else. Okay. So skip the end of that or the rest of that. 3 7. Buckingham comes back, and Richard's like, So did it work? Touched you the bastardy of Edward's children? I did. With his contract with Lady Lucy and his contract by deputy in France, the insatiate greediness of his desire and his enforcement of the city wives. Okay. You got a gloss down there. His forcible seduction. In other words, Edward didn't only fool around once. It's kind of like JFK. You know, he was having women brought in. Okay. His own bastardy, line nine, as being got your father then in France and his resemblance being not like the Duke. With all I did and for your lineaments, being the right idea of your father. You, and, and Shakespeare's going to draw on this idea an awful lot in the sonnets. Okay? You look like your father. Edward didn't. That could be taken to be proof that he wasn't his father's son. Both in your form and nobleness of mind, that is, and your mind is like your father's, which Edward's wasn't, laid open all your victories in Scotland. So he's denigrated Edward IV while he praises Richard's victories in Scotland, your discipline in war, your wisdom in peace, your bounty, virtue, fair humility, indeed left nothing fitting for your purpose, untouched or slightly handled in discourse. I praised you to the heavens. And when mine oratory drew toward in, I bid them that did love their country's good cry. That did love their country's good. That is, not think their country was good, but did love what would be best for their country. He bid them cry. God save Richard, England's royal king. And yet who should be slash is king upon the death of Edward IV. Even the person is called that even before the coronation. You know, if a king dies, let's say, um, oh, which one was it? George VI, when, when George VI died, no, not George the Sixth. The one who died before Queen Elizabeth, what was, her, what was her father's name? I think it was George. When he died, immediately, what happens upon the death of the monarch, the eldest son, they say, God save the king. Even though the king hasn't been hasn't gone through the process of what's called investiture, the, the total coronation. You know, Queen Elizabeth was queen before the royal ceremony at Westminster Abbey in 1953. Her father died like a year before that, okay, in 52. And he, and, you know, she had to go through the process, the preparation. Well, some of that happened before, okay? So, God save Richard, England's royal king, implies what? The little prince isn't going to be a king for long, okay? And did they? Notice, print, you know, he's like, please say yes, they did. No. So God help me, they spake not a word. Skip the rest of Buckingham, 42. What tongueless blocks were they? Would they not speak? There's an idea that Shakespeare brings up or uses in Julius Caesar. Blocks of stone, that is, blocks that don't speak. In um, Mark Antony's funeral oration about Caesar. What tongueless blocks were they? Would they, that is, desired they not to speak? Not didn't they? No. By my troth, by my promise, by my truth. 
So is the mayor going to come? And his brethren, the mayor's here, intend some fear. Line 60, 45. Okay? Pretend. That is, he doesn't mean pretend to be afraid, but pretend to be kind of anxious, tremulous. Be not you spoke with, but by mighty suit. Make them really big. And look, get a prayer book in your hand. Oh, even better. And get two churchmen to stand up. What are we talking about here? What is this whole scene about? Or at least these lines. Making Mr. look like he's got strips. Okay, keep going. Who's doing the making him look that way? What modern role would Buckingham be serving right here? His advisor. What kind, specifically? The political, public. Political, public relations, media advisor. Because, because what's he doing here? He's creating what? An image. He's creating an image. What's the image? Art. Holy. Religious. Dutiful. Humble. I, I don't want to. I really, I don't want the job. The Department of English has just appointed a new graduate advisor. I told the chair, I actually nominated the person uh, who got the position. She didn't want it. She didn't want it. Okay? And I said in my kind of nomination thing, the very fact that she doesn't want it, that's a good, a good mark on her side. So usually, you know, I have trouble, you know, voting for somebody, for president. Why? They all want it too bad. Every one of them, I mean, they're willing to almost sell their mothers in order to get that job. Okay? Just for once, I'd like to have somebody who has a shot at winning go, I don't really want to do this, but I will for the good of the country, kind of, as long as they're honest, but they probably will. So he's creating totally this image. This is Shakespeare telling us, showing us, how much he understands image is important in politics. It's one of the things. I should go there, but I won't. I don't, his policies, I think, are out of this world crazy. I'm far right wing. Bernie Sanders, he would bankrupt the country and just send, in my opinion, send us down the tubes. What I like about Bernie Sanders He's honest. He's a good, honest to goodness socialist. He's not going to candy coat anything. He's not going to sugarcoat it. Other than saying, all my ideas will work. But, I mean, he comes across kind of as a grumpy old scold. Because he's a grumpy old scold. He doesn't try to pretend everything's going to be fine. Okay? Stand between two churchmen, for on that ground I'll make a holy descant. Line 49. The plain song or melody on which a descant or melodious accompaniment is raised. That is, you will be the ground, you will be the melodious, the whatever, okay? He says, and I'll accompany your position, your point. And be not easily won to our requests. Okay, now, what does... Buckingham obviously know about Richard. He wants it. How badly does he want it? Yeah, he's killed for the job. Far as I know, neither the current president nor any former presidents, again, as far as I know, I could be willfully, you know, <laughs> in the dark, have killed for the job. I know people say stuff about the Clintons, but I'm not going to go there. Okay? Be not easily won to our requests. Play the maid's part. That is, oh, you want me to be king? Play young and virginal, in other words. Still answer nay and take it. One 
of my distant relatives, not a direct ancestor, but a relative, famously had the Republican Party want to run Kim for president to be the nominee, General Sherman. He famously said to the Republican Party, if nominated, I will not run. Okay. If a candidate or if elected, I will not serve. That is, you can nominate me, but I'm not going to run. If you nominate me and I'm elected, I won't serve. That's not what's going on here. I mean, he made it clear. You don't want the job. He says what? Answer no, but take it. I go. So Buckingham comes in with Catesby and others. And we hear 70, 70 or so. My lord, this prince is not an Edward. He is not lolling on a lewd love bed, but on his knees at meditation. That is, at prayer. He's not rolling around in the sack with some whore. He's praying to God. Not dallying with a brace of courtesans, that is, not in bed with two hookers, okay, courtesans, but meditating with two deep divines. He's at prayer with two weighty, intellectually, not fat, churchmen. Not sleeping to engross his idle body, but praying to enrich his watchful soul. Happy were England. Were. Happy, it's subjunctive. Would England be? Would, if this virtuous prince take on his grace the sovereignty thereof. His grace, that's his title. It's related to his title. You call a duke also his grace. Okay? You don't go, hey, Richard, how you doing? Unless you're best friends. You know. But sure, I fear we shall not win him to it. The mayor, well, God defend his grace, should he say no to us. So what's Buckingham already got? He's already got the mayor begging for it. Okay. So others come in, and we see Richard come in. Aloft, so he's on a balcony between two bishops, not even just regular ordinary priests, bishops, prelates of the church, two props of vir props. <laughs> What's a prop? Well, one meaning of it is something you put on a stage to help create a scene, an image. Prop can also be what? Something that holds you up. Well, Buckingham means that sense. They are holding him up. Why? Because of his innate sinfulness. Without them, he would fall. He needs the church, in other words. Two props of virtue for a Christian prince to stay him from the fall of vanity. Oh, no. Richard has no vanity at all. And see, oh, look. Pay attention to the details. Notice what Buckingham's doing. He is reading the image for the mayor and those with him. By reading it, he's doing what? He's interpreting it. He's telling us what's important. Book of prayer in his hand. True ornaments to know a holy man. True? Obviously not. Right? Because you could put a Bible in the hand of a monkey. Doesn't mean the monkey is suddenly, you know, quote unquote Christian. Famous Plantagenet, most grateful, most gracious prince, lend favorable ear to our requests. Pardon us the interruption. Sorry. We don't mean to get between you and God. We need you. Okay, no, no, don't apologize. Pardon me who earnest in the service of my God deferred the visitation of my friends. I, I know you guys have been waiting. I'm sorry. I, I just had to talk with God. Just look at the rest of the scene. What's it show? Sheer 
brilliance on the part of Shakespeare for what? If Shakespeare wanted to, let's say we could revive Shakespeare and bring him back today. What politician would not hire him to be his media savant? Because <laughs> what would Shakespeare do? There would be no unplanned you know, media gaggle. Everything the politician would do would what? It would be choreographed just like that. So what does this show us about Shakespeare? Your, your introduction mentions, mentions Machiavelli. How many of you have read The Prince? Anybody? Uh, if you haven't, you need to. So important. Why? Because Machiavelli deals with the central issue, maybe not the, a central issue for a prince, a monarch, a king, a president. Is it better? To be, anybody know how it goes? Loved or feared? How does Machiavelli answer? It's better to be feared. Because if all you have is the people's love, then what do you lack? And I, it's not that you lack fear. What do you lack? From the people. <clears throat> Respect part of it. Okay. What else? Louder? Authority. Authority. If, what can this devolve into? Be your best friend. See, and the, the American presidency kind of changed with Clinton. And I'm not talking good or bad. I don't care what your politics are. Prior to Clinton, how did every American presidential aspirant, candidate, um, go about campaigning? What did he or she, because there were uh, women who ran for president before Clinton, Pat Schroeder in 84, I think it was, um, what did they do? Who, who did they speak to? Where did they speak to people? Yeah, you rotary clubs, that kind of stuff. Conventions, okay? Various kinds of meetings, town halls, and all that kind of stuff. What did Clinton do that no presidential candidate had ever done before him? He played saxophone on SNL. He played saxophone before SNL on the Arsenio, Arsenio Hall show. Hall, that's right. Arsenio Hall is kind of you know, the way of the dodo. <laughs> When he played saxophone on Arsenio Hall, he went on SNL, he went on MTV. Okay. Talking about those boxers <laughs> on MTV. Showing what? Man of the people. I'm a common, ordinary hero. Just like you. Reagan didn't do that. Carter didn't do that. Though Carter kind of came closer. Yeah, I'm just a simple old peanut farmer from Georgia with, but was also a nuclear engineer on the Nautilus. I think it was the Nautilus. Nuclear sub. In other words, brains out the wazoo. But peanut farmer. Common, everyday, ordinary. Clinton wanted this. Okay. Wanted to be loved. Machiavelli said, it's better to be feared. Why? You can get their love after being feared. Hard to get their fear if you're their buddy, if you're their best friend. Okay? What do we see here? Richard's working at both ends. He's creating an obviously false image, right? We're, we get the behind-the-scenes look that a lot of people don't see. What's the behind the scenes look? This guy is the person for whom the term Machiavellian was created. It's like Machiavelli did not have a reason to exist until Richard came along. And 
What's the importance of this? It shows us Shakespeare is familiar with Machiavelli. He's familiar with his work. Okay. So what? By including this kind of language, by portraying the mon the monarch in this way, doesn't Shakespeare also suggest hmm, other monarchs other than Richard could also do this? Think of Queen Elizabeth. After the defeat of the Spanish Armada, Elizabeth did not tamp down the public praise, people calling her Gloriana. That's like glory to you in the highest. It's elevating her. She didn't tamp down when people said, you are God's chosen representative. You are God's viceroy here. You are God to us. She, she, she was like, keep going. You're getting close. All right. So when Shakespeare uses that language here and suggests, you know, this is how Richard was, and then later on, we see the play Richard II written, and then Richard II in like 94, 95. And then Richard II gets re, um, what's the phrase I want? Um, they bring it back for a revival. In the early 1600s, before Elizabeth died. Okay? But it's brought back at such a point when there is a plot against Elizabeth's life. Shakespeare gets in trouble. Why? Well, Richard II is all about the deposing of a king, but it's not nearly as Machiavellian as this. So, so what gives? Why is Shakespeare in trouble for that, but not for this? Well, who's the Machiavelli here? The person that Elizabeth's grandfather killed. See, all of Richard III is designed to foster the Tudor dynasty. It's part of the Tudor myth or mythos. Okay? So, you know, 116 and following. Buckingham says, It is your fault that you resigned the supreme seat, the throne majestical, the separate office of your ancestors, your state of fortune and of your new birth, Lineal glory, blah, 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 blah. So he says, in this just cause come I to move your grace. The just cause. That's usually language dealing with war. But he says this just cause is what? The cause to move you for what? Accept the kingship. Richard, I don't know. 154. Your love deserves my thanks. And I know we're taking a long time. Your love deserves my thanks, but my desert unmeritable shuns your high request. I don't really deserve this. You're offering it to the wrong person. First, for, here's a problem. If all obstacles were cut away and my path were even to the crown as the ripe revenue and due of birth, that is, if I had a straight shot, if I were directly in line, yet so much is my poverty of spirit so mighty and so many my defects, I would rather hide me from my greatness. My poverty of spirit. I am poor in spirit. Hmm. Seems to me that's part of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, Christ says. They shall. That's the meek. See God. So he's just said, oh, I'm one of the poor in spirit. So mighty in defects and such. Being a bark to brook so mighty see that in my greatness covet to be hid. That is his defects. Then in my greatness covet to be hid and in the vapor of my glory smothered. But God be thanked, you don't need me. Thank God there's somebody else who can rule. In much I need to help you, you were their need, were their need. The royal tree hath left us royal fruit. 
Well, what's the royal tree? You, you take that family line, go all the way back to, you know, Edward III and stuff, which mellowed by the stealing hours of time, will well become the seat of majesty. What's the royal fruit? Edward V. Yeah, he's a boy now. But give him time. As he's protected and as he's educated, he will grow into a good and wise and loving and Christian and wonderful king. And make no doubt us happy by his reign. On him I lay that you would lay on me. That is, everything you want to put on me, let me put that on his little shoulders. This is your conscience arguing, Buckingham says. No, you say Edward is your brother's son. Yeah, we say that too. He is Edward's son. But not by Edward's wife. For first was he contract to Lady Lucy. Your mother lives a witness to this vow. In other words, he's implying that Richard doesn't know any of the rumors that have been swirling around town. Right? So he goes on, and the mayor says, Do good, my lord. Your citizens entreat you. Do good. Do what is right. Refuse not this proffered love, Buckingham says. Catesby, grant their lawful suit. Richard, why should you why would you heap this care on me? What does heap imply? You're in a heap of trouble. Is that just like one little problem? It's a whole bunch piled on top of you. I am unfit for state and majesty. I do be, I, I, I won't. I cannot, nor I will not. Notice two different things there. Cannot, it's impossible. Will not, I don't desire it. Buckingham. If you refuse it, lo, to depose the child, your brother's son, as well we know your tenderness of heart, and gentle kind of feminine remorse, which we have noted in you to your kindred, and equally indeed to all states, you know where you accept our new suit or no, your brother's son shall never reign our king. Okay, so what's Buckingham seemingly getting down to? Brass tacks, right? What does that mean? Whether you take the kingship or not, Edward's son will never be king. That's a threat. He's saying, this boy, this bastard, he will never be king. I'm not going to take him off. We will plant some other in the throne. What's Buckingham saying he and the others have authority to do? Appoint God's chosen. Appoint God's cho God chooses. Oh, don't swear. No, 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 no. My Lord of Buckingham, don't. Will you enforce me to a world of cares? Why is Richard now considering it? I don't want you to kill the little prince. He's a good kid. Call them again. I am not made of stone. Like the citizens were, those blocks of stone who would not speak. Richard's saying, I'm, I'm not made of stone. You've worn me down. Penetrable to your kind entreaties, albeit against my conscience and my soul. They come in. Since you will buckle fortune on my back to bear her burden, whether I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. But if black scandal or foul face reproach attend the sequel of your imposition, that is, if... Scandal or foul faced reproach follow your imposing this on me. Your mere enforcement shall acquaintance me, acquaintance me from all the impure blots and stains thereof. For God doth know, and you may partly see how far I don't want to go. Long live Richard, England's worthy king. The only problem is. Two little princes. All right. So, four one. We hear the Duchess. That's the old Duchess of York. That's Richard's mother. 
Okay. Comes in. There's Anne. There's Elizabeth. They talk all back and forth. And we hear Brackenberry refer to the king. Line 17. And Queen Elizabeth says, The king? Who's that? Why? There hasn't been a public ceremony. There hasn't been a public proclamation. Who technically is the king? If you remember, you know, I, I had the chronology up here. Little Edward V reigned for not quite one full year. Okay? Edward IV died in 1483. Edward V ruled in 1483. Richard became king in 1483. Three kings, one year. Oh, the, the Lord Protector. Sorry. The Lord protected from that kingly title, Elizabeth says. All right. Stanley comes in. Such a yay. He's talking to Anne. You, you got to come to Westminster. There to be crowned Richard's royal queen. She can't be crowned queen until what? Yeah, until he's king. Okay. So there's a lot of going back and forth. 65. Elizabeth tells her, Go, go, poor soul. This is actually 63. I envy not thy glory. To feed my humor, wish thyself no harm. I, I don't wish any harm on you. And Anne, why? When he that is my husband now came to me, as I followed Henry's corpse, and scarce the blood was well washed from his hands, which issued from my other angel husband, and that dear saint which then I weeping followed. Okay. And she talks about what happened between she and Richard and how she was one. 82. For never yet one hour in his bed did I enjoy the golden dew of sleep, but with his timorous dreams was still awake. Okay. So she says, I never got a single hour of sleep in Richard's beds. Why? Because he has startling dreams. Okay. Why else? She cursed his bed, and therefore anybody in his bed would be cursed with poor sleep. Besides, he hates me for my father Warwick and will no doubt shortly be rid of me. She knows what's going to happen. Richard's going to have me killed. Okay. So, they start to go, and Queen Elizabeth says, Look back with me unto the tower. Pity you ancient stones, those tender babes. Who are the tender babes? Princess. Whose princess? Hers. They're her sons. Whom envy hath immured within your walls. Ninety-nine immured, walled now, there might be a little hint there of how the little princes were killed. Now, according to the text of the play, they're smothered, right? Well, how, what's another way you can smother someone? If you've ever read Poe's, Great the Cask of Amontillado. You know, I'm up, you wall them up in a little room, and they run out of air and suffocate. Okay? Rough cradle for such pretty little ones. Little pretty ones, rude, ragged nurse, old, sullen playfellow for tender princes, use my babies well. So foolish sorrows bid your stones farewell. Okay? So, now we get King Richard, beginning in Act 4, Scene 2. And we see a lot of going on back and forth. And Richard gets several asides. Why? Well, look at the first one. Page 28. Uh, line 28. Buckingham and Catesby are nearby. And Catesby's like, the king's angry at me. Biting his lip. In other words, that's a nervous tick. And the king says, I will converse with iron-witted iron fools and unrespective boys. Who are the iron-witted fools and unrespective boys? Uh, that would be Buckingham <laughs> and Catesby. In other words, they got him to his position, and now what? 
Yeah, I no longer have need or use for them. None are for me that look into me with considerate eyes. Look at your gloss. Uh, lost my place, line 30. Lost it again. Apparently I have no choice but to communicate my intentions to dim-witted fools and inattentive boys. I will have nothing more to do with men who look into my thoughts too searchingly. In other words, he's kind of saying, they're asking questions, making insinuations they shouldn't ask or insinuate. High-reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. High-reaching, ambitious. Buckingham wants more, and he's growing wary. Okay, well, Buckingham turns on him. So, more talk going back and forth. Line 42, the deep-revolving, witty Buckingham. What kind of person would Buckingham be today if we were talking the political realm? You could say maybe like a member of Congress or something like that, but he's not really. Since we don't have the royal system, what purpose does he serve for Richard? He's an advisor, right? Well, what kind of advisor would he be? Maybe like a chief of staff who no longer wants to be chief of staff, but would rather be the person the chief of staff reports to, the member of Congress. Okay. He thinks Buckingham is what? Plotting against him. Okay. So, they keep going. Line 60. Uh, back up. 56. Richard says, Give out, that is, let it be known, that Anne, my queen, is sick and like to die. Likely to die. Skip a bit. Line 60. I must be mar married to my brother's daughter. Who's that? That's Lady Elizabeth. Okay. Or else my kingdom stands on brittle glass. That is... Shaky ground. He needs to be married to her for what person? What purpose? To unite, not unite like Richmond is going to do, not unite Lancaster and York, okay? But to unite the two and to produce an heir. Or else my kingdom stands on brother glass. Murder her brothers. Who are her brothers? Two little princes. <clears throat> then marry her. But I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Tear falling pity dwells not in this eye. Tear dwelling pity dwells, tear falling pity dwells not in this eye. What's he mean? No empathy. He's incapable of it. That's why I say. Richard, as Shakespeare portrayed him, is a sociopath. He will do whatever it takes to get what he wants. Kill his wife? Sure. Kill the princess? Sure. Kill everybody who helped him rise to power? Sure. Okay. So, Buckingham comes back in with Terrell. Thankfully, it's James and not Josh comes in, and Buckingham says, um, do you remember my just request? 94 or so. I do. Remember me? Henry VI did prophesy that Richmond should be king when Richmond was a little peevish boy. So Henry VI prophesied before his death, Henry of Richmond would be the king. Okay, so Richmond. Go back to pick up with 103. What's Buckingham asking Richard about? He promised me a dukedom or earldom. Which, which one did he say? An earldom. You said if I helped you, you'd make me Earl of. Has it happened? Nope. Richard. 
Richmond. When last I was at Exeter, the mayor in courtesy showed me the castle and called it Rougemont, at which name I started, because a bard of Ireland told me once I should not live long after I saw Richmond. Rougemont, Red Hill, Red Mountain, Richmond, Rich Mound, Hill, Mountain. Shakespeare's punning on the two terms. Okay? So they go back and forth. And what's Richard essentially say? Line 118. I'm not in the giving mood today. Does he mean literally just today? Okay, he means surface level, yeah. I think he means, no. You're not going to get there, Earldom. So everybody leaves except for Buckingham. Buckingham gets a soliloquy. And is it thus? Repays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Okay, notice. Individuals can make kings. We're not reading Richard II. I wish we were, but we don't have time. Because at the end of Richard II, we see how Henry IV, the next play we will read, how Henry IV becomes king. Right? So that when Henry IV opens, we're going to hear the voices of those who helped made him king say and ask, um, he doesn't trust this now, does he? Right? So Shakespeare keeps raising this, this issue of monarchy and how secure a monarch can be. Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone to Brecknock while my fearful head is on. Brecknock is Brecon, B R E C O N. It's a place in Wales. By going there, he leaves England. By going there, what's he really doing? switching sides. Okay, 4-3. Tyrell comes in. And we now hear the bloody act is done. The two little princes have been murdered. Okay. King Richard says, line 36, the son of Clarence have I pent up close, his daughter meanly have I matched in marriage. The sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom. Notice he's assuming they went off to heaven because they were little. And Anne, my wife, hath bid this world good night. <laughs> She's dead. And now, for I know the Breton Richmond aims at young Elizabeth, my brother's daughter, and by that knot looks proudly on the crown, to her go I, a jolly, thriving wooer. Richmond is courting Elizabeth, so he's saying, I'm going to try and beat him to the punch. Okay? And what starts to happen? Right after, I mean, just almost exactly at the end of Act 4, Scene 2, when Buckingham bolts, the whole plot starts to unravel. Ratliff, Ratcliffe comes in. What does he say? Morton has fled to Richmond. That is, to the Duke of Richmond. Morton is turned. Oh, and Buckingham. Back by the hardy Welshman, he's in the field. And his power grows. Backed by the Welshmen, backed by the Welsh armies, Buckingham is raising an army to do battle. Ely with Richmond troubles me more near than Buckingham. He says, I've learned that fearful commenting has led in servitor to dull delay. What does that mean? Fearful commenting is led in servitor to dull delay. Look at your footnotes. Timorous talk is a sluggish attendant to dull delay. Fearful talk will do what? Cause us to pause. We need to not worry about it. We need to go on. Okay? Delay leads impotent snail pace bigory, then fire expedition being my wing. In other words, we're going to strike. We're going to go now. Okay. Muster the men. 
My counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. We must be brief. He doesn't mean it's going to be, be, a, be a brief war. He means we have to act fast. So old Margaret comes in, and she kind of acts like a chorus. If you're familiar from a chorus in a Greek tragedy, they come out, and they kind of comment on what's been happening. Sometimes they give you a clue as to what's about to happen. Now prosperity begins to mellow. Prosperity. Think of it in modern political terms. That great 3% GDP, it's down to like 0.5%. The economy is not growing. Things are going stale and drop into the rotten mouth of death. Here in these confines, slyly ever lurked to watch the waning of mine enemies. The waning. She's saying, I'm going to outlive them all. A dire induction am I witness to and will to France. That is, and I'm going back to France. Hoping the consequence will prove as bitter, black, and tragical. Withdraw the wretched Margaret. And in comes Queen Elizabeth. Mourning her dead son. She says, line 11, If yet your gentle souls fly in the air and be not fixed in doom perpetual, hover about me with your airy wings and hear your mother's lamentation. What? If your souls are flying in the air and are not in doom perpetual, what's doom perpetual? Hell. So if they're not in hell, why would they be flying about in the The doctrine of, or the idea of what happens when the soul leaves the body. Some Christians throughout the ages have thought it's not immediate. Your soul is either in heaven or hell. If it, it might be that it's going to heaven, but it might take a little while. That is, there might be a purgatory process. And as it goes through the air, it gets attacked by demons and such. And angels come and they help fight off the demons. It could be that. So if your souls are going to heaven, she says what? Hang on. Hover about me and hear my lamentation. Why? It's a lamentation for their souls. This lamentation would be something that could, theoretically, help the souls progress. Showing these were good children. Don't hold these little sins to their account. Okay? Okay. So, Margaret, hover about her. Say that right for right hath dimmed your infant more into age and night. In other words, you little bastards, you got what you had coming to you. Why? Because what happened to her husband and son? Yep, so the Duchess goes on, and then the Queen, Plantagenet, or Margaret, Plantagenet doth quit Pen Plantagenet. Plantagenet kills Plantagenet. Edward for Edward. Edward V, Elizabeth's son, for Edward IV, Margaret's son. Or excuse me, the other Edward, Henry VI's son. Okay? And they just do this back and forth. Until Margaret comes forward and addresses Elizabeth. And she sits down. Line 39, tell o'er your woes again by viewing mine. Tell o'er doesn't mean repeat them. It means count them. You go to a bank, you withdraw money. Who do you see if you're not using ATM? A bank teller. The person who tells out, counts out the money. So count out your woes again. How? By viewing mine. Let me talk to you about sorrow. I had an Edward till a Richard killed him. I had a Harry till a Richard killed him. Son, husband. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard, the youngest of the princes, till a Richard killed him. The Duchess. This is Richard's mother. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too. Thou hopest to kill him. Margaret, and you also, you had a Clarence, and Richard killed him. 
from forth the kennel of thy womb. What is she just called? The Duchess of York. A bitch. Your womb is like a kennel. What comes out of the kennels? Dogs. A hellhound that doth hunt us all to death. That dog that had his teeth before its eyes to worry lambs and lap their gentle blood. That foul defacer of God's handiwork. That excellent grand tyrant of the earth that reigns in galled eyes or weeping souls. Thy womb let loose. <coughs> In one of Shakespeare's other plays, Lear, let loose the dogs of war. Shakespeare loved to repeat phrases from one play to another. So, your womb let loose to chase us to our graves. O upright, just, and true disposing God. In other words, Margaret says, I don't blame God. This is Human choice, human free will. How do I thank thee that this carnal cur, this fleshly dog, preys on the issue of his mother's body and makes her pew fellow with others mourn? Pew fellow, intimate associate. Pew refers to like a church pew. You're you're there like at a funeral. Now you know what it's like. The Duchess, stop. Triumph not in my woes. Okay. Margaret, I mean, she's just loaded for bore here. She's been fed up all throughout the play. Look at 63 through 79. Thy Edward, he is dead, that killed my Edward, thy other Edward, blah, 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 blah. So that, dear God, I pray that I may live and say, the dog is dead. Richard, let me live, God, just long enough to see Richard dead. Elizabeth, thou didst prophesy the time would come that I should wish for thee to help me curse. She did, right? We talked about it earlier. That bottled spider. Margaret, I called thee then. Vain flourish of my fortune. That is, I should still be queen. Instead, you're queen. You are the mere attendant to, the adder on to what was my glory. I called thee then, poor shadow. Why shadow? What is your shadow? It's a poor representation of you, right? It's not the real you. It has no solidity. Painted queen. The presentation of but what I was, blah, 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 blah. So, jump down towards the end of that. She says, Thou didst, 109, Thou didst usurp my place, and dost thou not usurp the just proportion of my sorrow? In other words, guess what? When you took my position... You get everything that goes along with that. Not just the glory, but the sorrow. Now thy proud neck bears half my burdened yoke, from which even here I slip my weary head and leave the burden of it all on thee. Take it all. I don't want it anymore. Farewell, York's wife and queen of sad mischance. These English woes shall make me smile in France. In other words, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Shoots the middle finger to England and goes off to France. Richard comes in. 136. And says, Who intercepts me in my expedition? That is, who interrupts me? It's his mother. Oh, she then might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb. Oh, if only I'd aborted you. That's what she means. From all the slaughters wretch that thou hast done. 
That is, I would have intercepted those slaughters. Intercept. Stop. Queen Elizabeth talks, the Duchess talks, Richard comes back. He hasn't left. He's just, you know, listening. A flourish trumpets. That is somebody. <laughs> alarm drums. Let not the heavens hear these telltale women rail on the Lord's anointed. Shut these old hags up. I'm the king. They can't talk to me like that. Ooh. What's the Duchess, though, also? Mama. Ain't nobody going to tell Mama who. She can't tell her son what for. Strike, I say. That is, make the noise. Well, is the noise stopping them? No, it's attempting to drown them out. Either be patient and entreat me fair. That is, speak to me fairly, appropriately, according to what? According to my title. I am the king. Therefore, how do you address me? Henry VIII, Elizabeth's father. If we were in the room with Henry VIII and he walked in that door, guess what would happen if I did that? Commoners could not look at him without fear of losing their head. You either did this, if he spoke to you, you talked to the ground. Unless he said, stand up, slime. Speak to me, peasant. Look me in, you wouldn't look him in the face. Right? Richard is kind of saying, I, I want some of that. I want the respect. Or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamations. Art thou my son? Thank God. My father and yourself. In other words, Yes. Thank you, Dad, and you. Then hear my impatience. He says, I don't want you. Came I not at last to comfort you? Richard is saying, wasn't I the youngest? So that I, I'm the youngest of five, as I always play with my siblings. They save the best for last. That's what he means. Wasn't I last to be your comfort? No. By the holy rood, that's the cross of Christ. Thou knowest it well, thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. Wow. Clarence was so much better than you. Edward was so much better than you. A grievous burden was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. In other words, she had a really bad pregnancy. I mean. Morning sickness, afternoon sickness, evening sickness. Thy school days frightful, so after he is born, desperate, wild, and furious, he got in all kinds of trouble. The prime of manhood, daring, bold, venturous. Thy age confirmed, proud, subtle, sly, and bloody. More mild, but yet more harmful, kind in hatred. What comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me with thy comfort? Hmm. She says, one more word and I'll never speak to you again. So, speak. Either thou wilt die by God's just ordinance, ere from this war thou turn a conqueror, that is, before from this war you become a conqueror, or I with grief and extreme age shall perish and nevermore behold thy face again. One of these two things is going to happen. You're going to die by God's just ordinance, or, before you leave from this war as a conqueror, I will die. Therefore, take with thee my most grievous curse. She's his mother. Which in the day of battle tire thee more than all the complete armor that thou wearest. My prayers on the adverse party fight. I'm praying for your enemy. And there the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies and promise them success and victory. Right? So she leaves. Richard, towards the end of that scene, Richard gets a long, actually, it's not towards the end of that scene, it's still in the middle, 291. 
Line 291 and following. What's the whole purpose of this speech? He's talking to Elizabeth. Queen, not princess. Okay. He's trying to woo her for her daughter. And what? how does it begin? You know, uh, what's done is done. It can't be what? Amended. What's that mean? Undone. I can't bring your husband back. Sorry. I can't bring your sons back. Oops. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes, which after hours gives leisure to repent. I made a mistake. Sue me. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. And she's supposed to go, sons in one side of the scale, daughter. Yeah, it's an even trade. Make bold, 325, 26. Her bashful years with your experience. Prepare her ears to hear a ruler's tale. Soften up your daughter for me. Put yourself in Elizabeth's shoes. What do you say? Like hell. Line 369, 368. By nothing, for this is no oath, because he's promised. He's, he's being honest now. What's his oath? By my George, St. George, patron saint of England. By my garter, the... Um, He's a knight of the garter, okay? And by my crown, she says, whoa, 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 this isn't any oath. Thy George profane hath lost his lordly honor. Thy garter blemish pawned his knightly virtue. Thy crown usurped disgrace his kingly glory. No, no, no. You want to swear by something, you got to swear by something that you haven't wronged. Well, how about myself then? Yourself is misused. Uh, okay. By the world. I haven't wronged the world. No, it's full of thy wrongs. My father's death. Okay, I had nothing to do with that. No, thy life hath it dishonored. Damn, woman. Okay, by God. Right? Because how can he harm God? How can... No, God's wrong is most of all. Why? If thou didst fear to break an oath with him, the unity the king my husband made, thou hadst not broken, hmm. nor my brothers died. If thou hadst feared to break an oath by him, the imperial circling now thy head had graced the tender temples of my child. And both the princes had been breathing here, which now two tender bedfellows for dust, thy broken faith hath made the prey for worm. Okay, now what are you going to swear by? The time to come, the future. How can he have harmed the future? No. Nope. You've wronged in the time or past, for I myself have many tears to wash, blah, 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 blah. And what, is this, what does the time of the past always lead to? The future. So he says, As I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my dangerous affairs of hostile arms. I intend to repent. When? Before he marries, possibly. Before he what? Before he dies. What if, like, you know, uh, Emily Dickinson's poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, He Kindly Stopped for Me. What if death comes unannounced? We all kind of have this image, you know. My death is when? way up in the future except when it's not and you hit my car or something else bad happens one of my students came into class Thursday night and then she left and she came back just totally in tears her dad died unexpected like 10 minutes unaccountable okay so she says, no. Let's skip a bit. Go on to five, because it's pretty short. So, actually, before we go on to five, a variety of messengers come in. What kind of news do they bring? Yeah, it's not good. 
<laughs> Third messenger, line uh, 509 or so. The news I have to tell your majesty is that by sudden floods and fall of waters, Buckingham's army is dispersed and scattered. He himself wandered away alone. No man knows whither. And he's like, yes. But then the fourth messenger comes in. Catesby comes in. Buckingham is taken. Okay. Go to 5-1. Buckingham. I want to speak with Richard. Why won't he let him why won't he let me speak with him? And Buckingham says to the sheriff, Hastings and Edward's children, Gray and Rivers, Holy King Henry, thy fair son Edward, Vaughn, and all that have miscarried by underhand corruption, foul un by underhand corrupted foul injustice. If that your moody, discontented souls do through the clouds behold this present hour, what? Even for revenge, mock my destruction. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to the sheriff. He's talking to all the people who died as a result of Buckingham's being an accomplice to Richard. And he said, this is all happening today, All Souls Day, to do what? To mock my destruction. I have this coming. Okay. So Buckingham prophesies, and we finally see Richmond. 5-3, we hear Richard finds out how big Richmond's army is and such. Okay. He gets ready for his battle. And beginning line 118. Uh, let's see here. No, let's back up. One, oh, uh, six, seven, 108. Richmond's left alone on stage. He gets a soliloquy. His soliloquy is really what? It's a prayer. O thou whose captain I account myself, look on my forces with a gracious eye. Put in their hands thy bruising irons of wrath, that they may crush down with a heavy fall the usurping helmets of our adversaries. Make us thy ministers of chastisement. That's how they would have pronounced it. That we may praise thee in the victory. To thee I do commend my watchful soul, ere I let the windows... Let fall the windows of mine eyes, sleeping and waking. Oh, defend me still. When I'm asleep, God defend me. When I'm awake, God defend me. And he goes to sleep. Then ghosts start to come in. So we've got Richmond on one part of the stage. It's not an actual soliloquy. It's a prayer because Richard's on the stage too. Richmond lays down, falls asleep. Richard's over here, and the ghost comes in, and the ghost comes in and walks over to Richard and says, Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. Thinks how thou stabs to me in my prime of youth at Tweaksbury. Despair, therefore, and die. And then he kind of goes over to Richmond. Meanwhile, you be cheerful. <laughs> For the wronged souls of butchered princes fight in thy behalf. King Henry's issue. Richmond comforts thee. And then he leaves. Okay. That's young Prince Edward. Then comes Henry VI. He comes in. And he does what? He curses Richard and he blesses Richmond. And then in come the ghosts of Rivers, Grey, and Vaughan. Brothers to and or lords of Elizabeth, the queen. They curse Richard. They bless Richmond. Hastings comes in. Now, Hastings was pretty big. He's a lot more major character than Rivers, Gray, and Vaughn. He really helped Richard. Bloody and guilty, guiltily awake in a bloody battle in thy days. Think on Lord Hastings. Despair and die. And notice what they all say to him. Despair and die. Why die with despair? Just go to hell. Yeah, go to hell. Despair is no hope. Okay? And then he turns to Richmond. Quiet, un 
troubled soul. Untroubled soul. What's that telling us about Richmond from Hastings' point of view? What kind of soul is untroubled? I don't know about you. I don't know whether you believe in a soul or not. I do. My soul is troubled. It's not totally at peace. Why? Blackness, darkness, sin, etc. He's saying you're perfect. You don't have any problems. Awake, awake, arm fight and conquer. The two young princes come to Richard. They say, weigh thee down to ruin, shame, and death. Thy nephew's soul bid thee despair and die. And then, shop, and then they go to Richmond. Good angels guard thee from the boar's annoy. Why the boar? It's his heraldic emblem. Live, beget a happy race of kings. And who is that happy race of kings? Henry VIII, and then not so happy, <laughs> Mary, Edward, Elizabeth, actually, in order, Mary, Elizabeth, Edward. Okay. Edward's unhappy sons, you bid thee, and then, you know, Anne comes, Buckingham finally comes, die in terror of thy guiltiness. But you, Richmond, cheer thy heart, and be thou not dismayed. God and good angels fight on Richmond's side. And Richard wakes up. O oh, coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? The lights burn blue. It is now dead midnight cold. Fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's nobody else nearby, so what should I fear? Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Wow. You need a classical case of narcissism, there it is. Then fly. What? For myself? Why? Lest I revenge? What? On myself? No. I am a villain. Yet I lie. I am not. Fool of thyself, speak well. Do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a different several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Okay. I'm a villain. Perjury, perjury, murder, stern murder, guilty, guilty, I shall despair. There is no creature loves me, and if I die, no soul will pity me. No soul will pity me implies no soul will pray for me. Wherefore should they, since I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Okay? Ratcliffe comes in. He and Richard talk back and forth. We see Richmond come up or wake up and stuff. And Richmond says, oh, I had the best night's sleep. Wonderful dreams, you know. Let's, let's do this. Okay. And he gets a long speech beginning with 237. Talks about how righteous their cause is. Richard comes in, page 697, right-hand column. Talks about how horrible conscience is. Okay? And pick up with 5-4. Rescue my Lord of Norfolk. Rescue, rescue. He's saying, rescue me. Why? Richard's left alone in the battle. So he says, a horse, first time. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. That is, is he saying my kingdom depends upon a horse? Give me a horse, and I'll give you the kingdom. What has he done for the kingdom? How many people has he killed in order to become king? And now he's willing to throw all that away for a horse. Catesby says, withdraw. I hope you to a horse. Slave, I have set my life upon a cast. That is, look at your gloss. Where to go? It's line nine. Throw of a dice. I've set my life. Lady Luck, be with me. <clears throat> and I will stand the hazard of the die. 
I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. What's he mean? Common? Go ahead. Decoys. Decoys were common. Okay. You go into battle, you have several people dressed up as you, if you're important. Why? So that the real you doesn't get you know slaughtered quickly. A horse, a horse, a king, my kingdom for a horse. And what do we see? Do we see Richard killed? No. We don't see it happen on stage. We don't see really Richard after that. I mean, you got the footnote or the thing, you know, they fight, etc., etc. Richard is slain. But he doesn't get any more speeches. And Richmond says, and we'll stop with this, proclaim a pardon. To the soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. That is, if they submit and return to us, they'll be pardoned. And then as we have taken the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enemy when traitor hears me and says not amen. What traitor says it? England hath long been mad. Mad doesn't mean angry. Crazy, out of its mind. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled been butchered to the sire, blah, 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 blah. Now let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, marriage, conjoin together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so. Elizabeth is the heir. Let their heirs enrich to the time to come with smooth-faced peace, with smiling plenty and fair and prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious Lord, that would reduce these bloody days again and make poor England weep in streams of blood. Well, the 1590s, yeah, it's kind of peaceful, kind of prosperous, prosperous except for the plague, okay? But it wasn't peaceful in the sense that there weren't undercurrents. And people still wondered, who's going to rule? What's going to happen when Queen Elizabeth dies? Um, we'll stop there. Questions? Comments? Not that there's much time for them. <laughs> okay, so for Thursday, try to do the first three acts. Of Henry the Fourth, Part One. I'm gonna. I was gonna drop a play today, and I thought, no, we're gonna try it. We're gonna try and see if I can do three X on Thursday. Uh, try to do the first three X of Henry the Fourth, Part One.